From Men of the Mississippi by Holling Clancy Holling Min the turtle was rather small for this Mississippi. For miles she was a chip caught in rapids and falls. When her tiny rear leg tired, she would drift until whack. Then she would push away from the boulder and paddle again. She fought to a shore, a brook, and a marsh. After a few weeks of life, Min felt like a battered old turtle. She came alive when a crawfish tweaked her side. Her angry baby strike sent her enemy backward. Crows eyed its string of watery mud clouds puffing along the brook. A raccoon family saw the mud smoke and came crawfish hunting. They sat in water, gazing at nothing, feeling under boulders. A sleek otter swirled by like a shadow. Mink. Otter. Ducks hurtled out of the sky, ripping the surface with spread feet skidding. To men, they were monsters, hinged at the surface, plunging their heads straight down. They ate bugs and beetles, at times nibbling men's rubbery toes with iron-hard beaks. As the air of the wild rice swamp grew cooler, the sky was fairly a rustle with leaves and more flying birds. Now spearheads of ducks and long-necked geese flashed by, and a mile up in the clear blue, a ghostly shimmering ribbon of wild white swans. Flocking crows dotted the trees, cawing, shouting, shrieking, shattering the silence. Some decided to stay on into winter, but not the old crow, whose air trail southward lay above this marsh. He hated cold. With old cronies, he flapped away. Raccoons hunting for crawfish. Little men felt numb. A cold-blooded reptile, she depended on warmth of air or water to keep her active. Searching in a slow, dull way for something, she spent long moments staring at muddy bottom. She had a desire to dig in it, deeply. Muskrats towed marsh roots to their rounded houses. Beavers stored poplar poles for the tasty bark. Otter and mink fished in ice-fringed streams. Big-footed snowshoe rabbits changed their brown coats to white. Pine squirrels flickered like running flames in the trees. Then white flakes laid a pad over the earth to be stitched by everything moving, from mice to moose. New cold came. Deeper snow. Life itself appeared to be chilled to an icy stop. Yet chipmunks and bears were only asleep. Frozen flies and mosquitoes were still living. While men, long since burrowed deep in the mud, was yet alive. Muskrat. Beaver. Min slept through the winter, living on the air stored in her strong lungs. Now, beneath mud and water, she felt new spring warmth. Like a sleepwalker, she dug her way out, floated to the surface, and breathed again. But floods hurled dazed Min through the marsh and into the Mississippi. It was a week before she found a quiet new swamp. Breathing again. Up from the winter sleep. The food from her food sack, together with a few beetles and grubs, had carried her through winter hibernation. Now she was thin, weak, and hungry. Many a wiggling thing was snapped up to make Min bigger. Some of her hunting was done by ambush. Under mud, unseen, her jaws snapped when food came near, and an unlucky snail or worm promptly vanished. Sometimes she hunted by walking along the swamp bottom. Several kinds of turtles are bottom walkers, though awkward about it. Min somehow balanced her weight so that enough of it held her down, and her rear end limp did not matter. Slowly she walked through veils of green water like a river spirit seeking forgotten things. Among swirling weeds, Min with her stately, relentless tread was an ancient monster marching out of the past. Two inches of relentless monster. A born hunter. Bottom walking. Ambush. Min's neighbors, the pert little terrapin, buttoned themselves to logs for hours, basking in the sun. Hot, dry sunlight discourages leeches and mossy growths, so the terrapin's shells were neatly smooth. Min preferred watery shade to sun, and so leeches became her close company, and tiny plants upholstered her shell in green velvet. This mossy coating would be shed each year. As her shell grew, spreading outward, its top layer would peel off like shreds of snapshot film, leaving her smooth and clean. 
Min was deaf, yet felt even faint vibrations. She was shy, but when she looked upon her world, she saw clearly, and she knew one color from another. She had much common sense. In high water, Min had settled in a deep pool of the swamp. When floods ran away, the pool shrank to a shallow pond. The day came when Min's back bulged above a drying puddle, baking in the sun. Terrapin gulped food in or out of water. But Min, a snapper, could not swallow easily except underwater. And there just wasn't enough water left. Min had no intention of starving. She splashed through scum to a baked clay bank and limped away. Min on land was different from Min in water. In a swamp, she lived calmly, snapping mainly to capture food. Here, her sensitive eyes disliked bright sun. She felt mean enough to snap at anything. A porcupine met her and she hissed like a viper. The big, bristling rodent backed up as she tottered past. When a fox put down an inquisitive nose, Min lunged at it. Her shell was less than three inches, but her neck and tail were so long that almost eight inches of angry reptile snaked forward in that strike. Though she missed and fell on her chin, the fox was impressed. When Min arose again, an armored warrior advancing, the fox switched his plume of a tail from the brush that held it and thoughtfully trotted off into thick ferns. After all, he had eaten well this morning. A Snapper's Water Pie for Dinner 1. Fish 34.2% 2. Carrion Dead Things 19.6% 3. Other Vertebrates Having Backbones 2.2% 4. Water Plants 36.2%. 5. Invertebrates, without backbones, such as insects, etc., 7.8%. Total pie, 100%. Percentages from Dr. Carl F. Logler, Economic Relations of Turtles. Min's waddling took her farther away from the Mississippi. In a bubbling brook, she ate happily, bottom walking upstream. But again, Min's water world deserted her. One day, the brook stopped flowing. It gurgled and ran away while crows fell out of the sky to feast on flopping minnows and tadpoles in the mud. Min scrambled to safety under draggled grass at the bank. She was confused. First, part of a wide swamp had shrunk to a puddle. Now a running brook had wandered away. Min stared blankly about her. Then, seeming to get an idea, she started to walk. The gurgling brook had gasped and then had run away downhill. Yet Min walked up, to a ridge of dead trees, sod and mud making a dam and a pond. Boys who had built the dam in the brook called this place an old swimming hole. Their fathers just could not understand how a brook choked with boulders, poles and clay produced better swimming than clean lakes and beaches of this summer resort land. The boys could not explain it either, except that, well, how could you feel that a long lake belonged to you? While a dam, built with your own hands, it made a swimming hole to be proud of. Even if cows did think they owned the whole thing. Now dried out Min took over. She owned the swimming hole. She found the pool to her liking, exactly. But startled boys glimpsed a something, now here, now there, and raced for help. Fathers and sisters came to fight this monster.